Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to the Tuesday, June 18th, 2019 regular selectmen's meeting. Um, as we are missing selectman Pendergast in Guinea, as we have our new selectman, Noah Cobb. Welcome him. As we have a town manager, a town clerk, town assessor, and the Envision Berwick group. Is, uh, welcome, everybody. Is, uh, please stand with me and salute the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item is the approval of the May 28th minutes is uh, we don't have a majority of the selectmen were here then so we'll uh, table that is uh, brings us to our first public comment if you have a public comment please step to the podium state your name and where you live and address the board Hi, Sean Goodwin 71 Sullivan Street <clears throat> just wanted to get a couple of things for the record and asked, did you receive a letter from the planning chair telling us to stop, telling you to stop activities next door at 70, next door in the parking lot? There were some communica email communications back and forth, you know, about that property, yes. I don't believe there was anything from the planning office itself saying to stop. It was from the planning chair? Is there was, uh, we had an email from the planning chair, you know, addressing that. And he made that suggestion, but yes, we do have that. He did. Um, I'm assuming it was shared with all the board members. Uh, I'm assuming it was. No. 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 Okay. Okay. Good. Um, curious to know if everybody on board, on the board, and is is in agreement to continue using it as you are, without any. Any enforcement of the 22 cars that you claim that you you want to do now? Um, there has been no formal vote, no. No. I had a couple questions for Mr. Pendergrass. I'm, I'm disappointed he's not here this evening. Um, did the town instruct the CEO not to enforce 22 cars over there? Not that I'm aware of. No. And um, the blocks that were moved through the center of the parking lot, what was the purpose of that other than to make all the cars park up against our fence and on our side of the lot? Um, I had nothing to do with that. It was for re to reduce the number of cars allowed to park there. That was the purpose. Yeah. But no other. On our side, you couldn't have done it towards the uh, rec field side? I probably could have but that's they didn't do it that way public works did the work without any instruction from you people no no has there been any um, any more on the survey suppose uh, we hired a company to survey the property and we also hired an engineer to uh, engineer the civil part of it to how we could lay it out uh, for future use um, I have not received anything from them yet I saw the engineer last week and he said that the, uh, he expected that the survey crew had already been out there but I, I can't guarantee that because we were told that what four or five weeks ago and we haven't seen any anything accomplished over there well, I, I, it doesn't take much to, I, it's a small lot in comparison to what they normally do. It was the same company that did the survey work for the new fire station, so I haven't heard from them yet. I'm sure I will get a bill and uh, the cost, but I'll have to tell you. So you move the blocks to limit the parking over there, yet you're not enforcing it? It's up to the code enforcement office to enforce it. I have not talked to him about enforcing it, um, and I'm not sure how many cars can actually fit in there, to be honest with you. We 
cut that down quite a bit to try to limit it. So. Um, yeah. Well, by limiting it, you're making it closer to us. Instead of having the blocks straight across, I, I, will, have, I, will. I have cars 12 feet from my bedroom window on any given night. And at 8, 30, 9 o'clock Saturday mornings. Once I complete the survey, the plan is we have budgeted to put a uh, fence up on both sides, yours and the one across the way. As soon as I have that survey, uh, it will, we will replace the fencing that we had and it will be much better uh, than what was falling down. But that's the plan. What size fence are you planning on putting in? It's a eight foot, I think, high, something like that. I got a price and what we, it should be a nice looking fence. I've asked nothing like with picks on it or anything. So. And is it fair to say that this will happen after the season's over and we've gone through the summer again the way it is? I expect the survey within the month. Uh, and as soon as I have the survey, I will give the people who uh, we got the bid from to put the fence up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any further public comment? We have no public hearing tonight. There's uh, reports of committees. Is the BCTV committee is not doing a report tonight. Is Envision Berwick. <sighs> Going to do a double duty tonight. Yeah. Here to uh, spread the word about uh, summer concert series, August 3rd, August 24th. Uh, bring them on chairs to Sullivan Square. It's really catchy. It's going to be a sweet event. Really cool. If you're not there, you're not cool. Um, so, something interesting has happened the past couple of days. We've gotten $800 of commitments for sponsorships in the past two days. Um, I guess all you got to do is ask. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to everyone that's um, you know committed already. Um, yeah, our goal is about we're, we're basically just trying to break even this year with the bands that we're we're hiring, and uh, try to build towards year two. So um, that's all I got yep. for now. Thanks. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. Um, we have no department reports tonight. Is we have appointments, presentations, and other guests. Mr. Rick Vandenberg is our other guest tonight to give us an update on the prime properties. Thank you. I'm Rick Vandenberg. Um, I live at 51 East Pasture Road, but I wear a second hat. I work for Cordieri Associates. And tonight here, I'm just to give you an update on, on progress relative to the cleanup that's gonna be going on at the Blue Sort building and on the parking lot in what we call lot 133. So we've been working for the past couple of months to come to some agreement with, um, with Maine DEP and to devise what the, the change in the cleanup will be. And, and you ask yourself, why, why is there a change to the cleanup? And that is because this past winter, we did some what we call additional characterization work. We took some more samples and the data came back so good for the soil that we, we decided to, rather than to create a parking lot and put the contam move the contaminated soil underneath the parking lot, instead of the Brownfields funds that we have available to us should be able to cover um, removing that material and disposing of it off-site at a place like Turnkey Landfill. And so we can get that out of there and bring uh, the entire lot 133 and um, the blue sort lot for the soil anyway down to uh, below what main DEP refers to as the remedial action guidelines for unrestricted use so in this case for residential so um, that's what we're doing um, we, we've submitted the uh, then that that amendment to our analysis of brownfields cleanup alternatives will be available on the town's website probably sometime tomorrow for the public to, to see and if you have questions um, please refer that refer them to me. My name is on the do all over the document. So f send me an email, ask me a question. I'm happy to answer it. The other two things that we're doing in addition to the soil removal, which you know all things go go correctly, we're we're pre preparing the last of our bid documents, and then the bids will come in. You know uh, probably sometime in early July, and then we'll we'll get them under contract. And we're telling in the the contractors who do the work that they've got to be done by September 30th because that's when the lot 133 grant expires and we have to be done expending money. 
we, we should be fine with that. You never know. I mean, hiccups can happen. People are busy, but um, that's what we're pushing for, 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 the, for the lot 133. For the blue sort building, we, um, when we did our work this past fall, we found that the spray-on insulation that's inside the building that coats the newest part of that building is um, full of asbestos. They had previously tested that, and they didn't find any asbestos in it the, um, when they did work, I don't know, it was maybe 10 or 12 years ago. Um, however, it's what we call a non-homogeneous material. So this material is, is mixed. So they just got a piece in their sample that didn't have any asbestos in it. We did, we took seven samples of it, and I think um, three or four of the seven came back with asbestos in it. So that was an added cost that we're, we're addressing with, with this amended approach. And um, we're going to hire an asbestos abatement company to remove all the asbestos from inside of the building. We originally were trying to toy with the idea of taking the, uh, so you know, everybody knows that that's a metal building and it's got, it's got a metal skin on the outside. And that asbestos is coated and sprayed on the opposite side, the side that you don't see. And we were toying with, with sort of encapsulating the whole building and then pulling those metal pieces off with the asbestos. But because of the nature of the asbestos, it makes it very difficult to do that and very costly. And the reason why we're toying with doing that is because if we took the panels off on the outside, the Brownsfields Fund would pay for rehab of that asbestos-contaminated metal that you took off there. In other words, you could put a new outside of the building on there. However, that's also very costly, and it's more than what we have for a grant. So that, that, we're not going to go in that direction. We think the best way is just to make a clean slate for whoever's going to redevelop that, that, that building to now they can, once, the, once we're done, they'll be able to go in there and they'll be able to either take the metal off and put a new side on or whatever they want to do. The last piece of what, there's two more pieces. The um, next to last piece is dealing with, there's some volatile organics that we detected underneath the building, which are like um, gasoline is, a, is an example of a volatile organic. Cleaning solvents are another example of a volatile organic in the soil, likely maybe underneath the building or somewhere proximal to the building. There's a little source of volatile organics. Again, what we detected though is below those remedial action guidelines, but the Brownfields funds will still help us protect future occupants of the building. So what we're going to do is if anybody's been in the, the floor is unlevel and there are cr it's cracked in numerous places and so we want to be protective. And so what we're specifying for, for that uneven, you know, um, and broken concrete is to level that out and put a two-part epoxy coating on that to, that would act as a vapor barrier. And so that's, that w that'll happen. And we've, we're going to specify three pieces, three different sections. The main section where the asbestos is, which is, you know, roughly 100 by uh, 50. And then the other parts are a little bit smaller. But the floors and the other two pieces are really, really in great shape. So we'll do the, to the extent that we have funding, we'll do the, when, depending on the bid co bids come back, we'll do the main piece, the, mo the most uneven piece, the pieces got some trenches that have to be filled and that stuff. We'll do that first. And then the other two pieces, you know, kind of along with that if we, can, if we, have, if we have the funding for it. Uh, last piece is some of the negotiation that we've had in the last few months with, with, May, with Maine DEP is they were concerned about that volatile organic source that's underneath the building. Because originally, if, you, if everybody remembers, the, the plan was to put residential there. And so we were going to assist with that by saying, you know, let's take, up this, take the building down, take up the slabs, take any volatile organic sources that are there and dispose of them off site. We can, we can leave them there currently. We just need to be protective of the, of the future occupants. And then to be further protective, we need to, we need to do some groundwater monitoring wells around the, around the building. And we'll do that as sort of our last piece. We'll take some groundwater samples. There's a pervasive source of what we call um, tetrachloroethylene. It's dry cleaning, basically dry cleaning. Sol it's a solvent that um, has been detected in a number of places around the prime facility, including a couple of small places on the, on the main lot. And ne a source has never really been identified. Well, well, for a hundred years, there's been you know lots of things that have happened, so it'd be hard to pinpoint it down. Uh, but what will from the work that we'll do at the end, it'll just help clarify if there's any pervasive source under there. And Maine DEP asked for that, so that's kind of what we're doing and, and what we're pushing for. And so that was the change. Those are the changes that to our analysis. Again, it'll be on on the town's website. So if if you have interest or you have, I'd be happy to field any questions if you have them now. Um, otherwise, um, please ask me by email. Board have any questions for Rick?
Mm, I got a couple. Not, go for it. <laughs> um, is uh, the 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 lot 133, the parking lot? You said that's going to be done this early, late summer, early fall. Yeah. Um, is that going to disturb the parking for the bus? Yeah. So so what when they're doing that work, there's a the the corner of Wilson and Sullivan has the largest area that we need to have that grass area. Think of that grass area as, as sort of the area that's gonna to have to be removed. That area about two feet deep is probably not more than two feet at all, but that'll have to come out, we'll go in trucks and it will go, it will actually be temporarily stockpiled on another part of the parking lot, along with some of the soil from the Blue Sort building in a separate stockpile. We'll sample those and get them ready for disposal because you got to take some other samples once you make your pile. Um, so for, for that probably three weeks, parking will be interrupted there. And James and I already started talking about getting the word out, putting some signage up and making the people that park there aware that there will be some I, I have a Coast bus meeting tomorrow morning and I'll uh, let yeah. them all know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and is, it, is it in the evening? Because I'd be happy to, to no, come and talk. No, it's the morning. Is it morning? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. If you want to just mention it, I can. We can. Cl I can clarify that yeah, I'll as tell, we I'll as tell, we move talk forward. Talk to Rad and Mike, and yeah, and let them know, and we'll. Uh, the contractor. Sure. So what we're, what we're doing with the excavation work? We're doing. We're using. Um, it's not. It's not really innovative, but I call it kind of an innovative sampling technique. It's called incremental incremental sampling methodology, and what it allows you to do is it. You look, when you have an excavation sidewall or an area that you want to sample, you take, rather than taking one sample and wondering whether you hit the right spot with the sample to get the worst case, incremental sampling allows you to take what we call aliquots, little pieces of sample from over the large area. And then you end up with what's called an exposure point. And so we're going to do, once we do our excavation work, we're going to do this ISM sampling on the bottom of the excavation and on the sidewalls to, to, to de demonstrate that we've got all the material that we needed to collect. And so we'll be doing that so the contractor will have to bring in some temporarily, bring in some um, either bollards or some, you know, some jersey barriers or something to cordon off the areas that we excavate. That's the biggest area. There's a couple little areas in the parking lot that we have to do. One that's up in the wooded area that's gonna be, we'll have to cut trees in order to get into. Um, and then there's one in the corner, almost where the stop sign is, or it's in front of the stop sign on the Blue Sort building. So those smaller areas are only like 10 by 10, 10 by 10 by two, roughly, depending on what we end up with, we might have to expand. But. And then the, on the, the, the Blue Sort building, the metal building, when, that, when would that be scheduled to be we're gonna try to We're gonna try to do, we're, we're, we're gonna bid it kind of a little bit different. Like normally we would say, well, we want one contractor to carry this and you have to hire all your subs. But we figure for efficiency's sake, we're going to have all the bid items be considered individually. And so if a floor company comes in, if there's a bunch of floor companies that want to deal, deal with the floor, but they don't, they don't want to do the asbestos, we think it's prudent to have them come in and, and do it. We're going to try to time it all such that it can occur. The asbestos has to happen first right. inside the building. Asbestos, then you do the floor, and then when outside, you, excuse me, outside you can do you can do the soil whenever that can be happening concurrently. Right. So we'll we'll be pushing for all of those things. We know that we're obviously pressed for time. The the blue sort lot does last for another year, but I'd rather be done with it to be honest. So be done, I, and then that way it lays the groundwork <coughs> for for next steps over there. Right. And you know the you said the 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 lot 133, the parking lot, is not as extensive as you thought, so we're saving money there. Is there any money that we could put back in over across the street? Any way to do that? We, we've already checked the, and it's a great question, we've, we've already checked the box. When, when that property transferred, we submitted a, a remedial action completion report to Maine DEP and they issued a certificate of completion. So, and then you get check a box in EPA's database that, said it's, that says it's ready for redevelopment. And so we would have to undo that. And I don't, so if we, if we took just this uh, L-shaped building back, <laughs> it is, uh, I, don't think, I don't think we can do that. Yeah, well, it's worth thinking about. Yeah. yeah. Are, are we going to be able to block off just part of, it of the parking lot so yeah. we can use some part of it? Yeah, so um, we can be creative. We, we, we'll, we'll definitely be It's really on those excavation days. If we bring in some jersey barriers, yeah. we, once we do the excavation work, the day of the excavation in some of the small areas, in the... And we're moving soil, those, that's the day. And then we can 
cover our stockpiles, sample them, we'll put them in a way so it's out of, out of the way, and then we can invite them back in okay. to park. Because I know it's been working out really, it seems to be working out really yeah, great. The, car, the park there. cars keeps increasing. <laughs> I know, I know. Any other questions? Thanks, Rick. Got it. Is that unfinished business? I don't believe we have any. Do you want to address the confined space? Um, uh, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to bring that up under other business, okay. but as uh, Patty and I discussed that earlier. But okay, good. Is, uh, um, town manager's report. How's that? That's good. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, we had submitted an uh, uh, application for a grant uh, through the state for dispatch. All the costs that we did with dispatch, it was done with South Berwick and uh, Sanford's uh, dispatch center. Um, and we were awarded everything we asked for. The total uh, reimbursement on the grant was $108,994. Of that cost, $41,133.67 comes back to Berwick, the way it's spent. So that was a real plus. Um, and that's, I don't really have a heck of a lot more. We got our 3% on the, the budget from the uh, state on, for our revenue sharing, which adds another uh, $100,000, hopefully, to our, uh, our expected uh, revenue, which is nice to see. <coughs> Put hoping, it in the bank. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd hope we were going to get the full five, which had been state statute, but that didn't happen. Her budget changed that. But I, I want to thank our representatives who advocated really hard for that for me because I inundated them with letters saying that I didn't think it was fair that they had promised us 5% this year. And, but I'll take three. I'll take what we can get. So hopefully, and then the following biannual, it goes up to 3.75. So we'll see a little increase that in that as well. But that's all I have for now. Thank you. Um, it is uh, Selectman's Communications. Is, um, I did receive a letter from the York County. It is actually, it's, you, can, you can look at it. It's requesting bill, payment of uh, bills. Oh, your tax bill? <laughs> Shame is, uh, well, we'll, we'll take care of that in our next meeting. We have to vote on it. So. Okay. Is, um, and, uh, and we do have a letter of resignation from Noah Cobb from the Planning Board. Is um, we had a couple months there, so it was fun. Yeah, <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll have fun here instead. So um, <clears throat> it is uh, that's something we need to vote on. Uh, just we, 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 we don't have a quorum other than you having no quorum. So, so you can't yeah, anyway. <laughs> not without unless yeah. no one votes on his own. You uh, should because you appointed him, so yeah. you should so. accept it. <laughs> well. And uh, we'll take care of that next time, too. Um, that brings us to accounts payable. <clears throat> we have an AP warrant, 1948, from May 30th, 2019. The amount is 699,637 dollars 30 We have a water warrant, 0948, from May 30th, 2019, for the amount of 7,000. $118.73. We have a payroll warrant, 1948 from May, May 30th, 2019, for the amount of $54,306.64. Account payable warrant, 1949 from June 6, 2019, for the amount of $163,917.85. We have a water warrant, 0949 from June 6, 2019, for the amount of $2,976.66. Payroll warrant, 1949 from June 6, 2019, for the amount of $60,049.77. <clears throat> a count payable warrant, 1950 from June 13, 2019, for the amount of $73,392.07. Water warrant 0950 from June 13, 2019, for the amount of $926.41. Payroll warrant 
And a payroll warrant, 1950 for June 13th, 2019, for the amount of $53,282.05. I'll make a motion that we pay our bills. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. That brings us to new business. And first is the election of Board of Selectmen Chair and Vice Chair. So since Ed and Mark aren't here, I think we should elect them, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to nominate Tom Wright for chairman one more year. I'll second that. <laughs> All those in favor? And uh, I haven't asked Ed, but I'm going to nominate him for vice chair again. Here he is now. No. Oh. A little man before he gets here. Yeah. <laughs> so, is, uh, well, I'll second that. Is, uh, all those in favor? There you go. <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, <clears throat> hey, Ed. How's it going? Mm -hmm. We just elected you as chair. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, 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 I nominated you for vice chair again. I hope you don't mind that. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, is, uh, in the June 11th, 2019 election results. Well, we had a whopping 242 people come and vote. Um, everything passed. Noah was elected selectman. We did not get anybody um, with more than one write-in vote for a school board. So if anyone is interested, they can send a letter of interest to Steve and the board can appoint that person. Um, other than that, all the warrants articles passed, the school, both the articles passed, no surprises. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> We're in a low turnout. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. We have no quick claim deeds. We have some abatements. Just one. One abatement. Just one abatement. One tree growth penalty and one abatement. Okay. Um, do the abatement first, I guess. This is for Karen. Uh, Vignalt and Joseph Gatowski um, of two, well they, they're of 270 Little River Road, tax map R16, lot 14. The, um, these people had um, purchased a lot from uh, this, this lot back in um, June 13th of 2017. And as part of that, they are obligated to submit a new tree growth application. When they did so, the application that they submitted was for 39 acres rather than the 43. So we issued a penalty in the, you know, for, the, for the four acres that was being taken out. Um, what we didn't realize until after that was that there was a previous parcel subdivided from this lot that had tree growth removed from it. So they were actually... Uh, those three acres were already removed. So we need to um, just abate them for those three acres. Um, so it's recommended that an abatement uh, from the previous, previously assessed tree growth penalty be granted in the amount of $913.79. Any questions of Paul? No, nope. I would move that we uh, accept the recommendation assessor and grant the abatement in the amount of nine hundred thirteen dollars and seventy nine cents as presented. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Um, second one is a tree growth um, penalty on tax map R sixty six lot six one ninety three route two thirty six. Subject property is a three point one acre vacant parcel that has one acre in tree growth as part of a tree growth plan with the, adjust, with the adjacent parcel, R666A. The subject parcel was transferred in ownership on 11-9 of 2018 to a new owner 
and because it is less than the 10 acre minimum for tree growth it is no longer in the same ownership as the adjacent land and a tree growth tree growth penalty must be assessed um, the penalty is the amount equal to 20 percent of the difference between the 100 percent valuation at the time of withdrawal in the classified on the classified land on the yeah it's 20 percent of the difference between the 100 percent valuation at the time it was removed and what what it was in uh, what the value was so it's uh, it was valued at 400 or 20 uh, 400 it's now valued at 2700 uh, which is a difference of $2,300 times 20% is $460. Is recommended that a tree growth penalty be charged in the amount of $460 uh, to Les Bodwell, of, uh, who is the owner, now owner of the property. Any questions of Paul? None. I would move no. that we accept the town assessor's recommendation to uh, charge tree growth penalty in the amount of $460 to the current owner as presented. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Paul. 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 All right. I'll let you know. All right. Here's, uh, that brings us to our second public comment. Second public comment. If you have a comment, step to the podium. I think everybody else here is for our meeting next coming up. So, is um, we have no executive session. Is other business and non-agenda items. Is uh, we do have the confined space program that staff presented to us. Is I uh, is where we need to. Uh, we already approved it, right? Yeah. Yeah, but you have to vote on it. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's nobody, right. we didn't, nobody, we didn't, we didn't we because nobody had looked at right. it. Right, we hadn't looked at it. <clears throat> so, is um, so is uh, is there a motion? I'll make the motion. Is I'll make a motion that we uh, accept the confined space program as presented to us by Star Glenn. I'll second your motion. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Thank you. Are you abstaining? I'm abstaining, yes. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that brings us to one final motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. Motion. All those in favor. And we are having a workshop. We'll set up is uh, the the uh, BCTV is going to put a little interlude on for us before we. Uh, Um, we're going to set yes. up a table. Yeah, we'll like, we'll set up the table. I think that would be the best yeah. way. And it's already done, huh? Mm -hmm. It's already designed. Well, it's just four, so you don't have to do it. It's almost done. It's almost done. It's almost done.
projector than focus. I guess I can fix it myself. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. here. Yeah, you're small. Is that this? Oh, there you go. Oh, nice. Well done. All right. Such a touch. You're all set? <laughs> here, you're all set. You got it? Okay. 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 Let me. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to have the meeting so we could discuss some of the things that we have coming up um, that need some decision making on, at least some definitive responses in terms of where we're going. Um, but I thought uh, James and I kind of put together, or James put together, and I sent him stuff to kind of put stuff on the board up here so we can talk about it and you can see it. Um, so we're going to talk, I'm just going to give you a brief oversight of this year's budget that takes in, into effect on July 1 and talk more about some of the uh, capital projects that we have confronting us and the ones that we'll be doing. And then we'll get into the traffic study, which is something James and I are looking for some kind of response from the whole group so we can start looking at grants um, and get your ideas on that, which will include sidewalks. And then Rick and I and James can give you an update on where we are in the prime tanning uh, site. And then uh, branding, we have a guest here who will talk to you about that. And then we can talk about fund the funding mechanisms to try to move some of these things forward, which I think we are at a very good point of, of where the Envision Berwick and the town as a whole planning board and board of selectmen have brought this whole village concept to light. So, um, we'll start. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I should touch this. Yeah, okay. Do you want to do the traffic study first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of in, in the, the presentations, kind of in the order of the agenda items. So, okay. I guess we got to stop at any, any time. Um, the big first thing with the traffic study that we really need help with direction on um, is around the town hall. And you've seen we've done some stuff with the bollards, those sticks sticks in the roads that have helped to reduce the travel lanes. It's really all about reducing speeds. So there's things that you can do to reduce the street width. You can do bump outs, you can paint. Um, we can look at raised crosswalks and we can put a raised crosswalk um, kind of across the street from subway um, main dot might have an issue with it but um, jim tassi for the main bicycle coalition mentioned he might help us kind of convince them that a raised crosswalk really could go well I, I i thought when we talked to them i thought he said that you know they were okay those you know it, it was when i talked about it with the jason and the traffic study he was the one that yeah. you know kind of you know didn't like the idea of uh is uh you know tim there you know to go for it. And, and that, the really the whole idea with the traffic study, the recommendation was to go two-way. And the whole reason for going two-way is to reduce the traffic speed. But if we can do other things, we can save a significant amount of money by not having to do that. By getting, um, maybe get a raised crosswalk on Rochester Street. Um, the main thing, um, the two main things I'd like to try to experiment with it would be getting Rochester Street to one travel lane. You can see the thing I sketched in beautifully in the six parking, parallel parking spaces. And what that would do is uh, would, um, reduce the traffic speed. And then getting a, a crosswalk from Spencer Matthews uh, <coughs> to Corner Point Brewing would help with our connectivity um, quite well. So, you know, you really hit upon the importance of reduced speed. So you go from a 40 mile an hour, you have a 10% chance of living uh, a car crash to 30 miles an hour, which is probably the average speed here. It's a 50% chance. You get it down to 20 miles an hour and you, you have a 90% chance of living. And I like those odds. And if we slow it down from 30 to 20 miles an hour, and the whole planning thing is you don't, you don't put speed limits up. You design the streets for that speed. And if we reduce it from 30 to 20 miles an hour, we're gonna add 30 seconds, 20 seconds, someone's commute. I think it's worth people living. Um, so grant, uh, CAX grant, we've already submitted. Um, I think we're uh, competitive. 
And I think um, we'll be in for 2022. That's just how the grant cycle goes. If not, I think we're right in line for 2023. So, so what it is, um, it's, it's improving the geometry coming down School Street and it's more of a straight shot to the Berwick Summers Earth Bridge. It improves the awkward School Street, Sawmill Hill intersection where, where neither person knows who's stopping where. And then you're looking at some, some curb improvements along um, Gateway, Gateway Gas. Uh, that seemed to, and then you have sidewalks continuing from the, the bridge. You have some bike lanes in there. Um, so improving the bikeability um, and, and getting the sidewalk down to Great Falls Park. Are there any questions with, with this? Cool. Um, so sidewalk priorities. If you look on the right there, there's some red that are our top, top priorities that um, you get it down into the downtown up to um, Great Falls Park, which that sidewalk will be integrated into our um, MS4 project. And then you have the other side of Sullivan because the side that's closest to the prime development really should be on the developer to do. And then getting um, the, the sidewalk up to the Wilson Street intersection and then all the way up to the existing sidewalks on Pine Hill Road. So assuming $60 a linear foot, might be more now, um, gives you a ballpark estimate of, of where we're at. High priority, secondary priority, really gets us in a good um, network. And then the future considerations are really long segments. Um, Old Pine Hill Road, um, all the way up to the the library, no, I guess the yeah. library one's a secondary consideration, but. <clears throat> Any questions on the sidewalks? The $60 a millennial foot, is that for the gold, our gold standard sidewalk? Yeah. Okay. That's for concrete, concrete. and yeah. granite curbing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think some of the most impactful sidewalks would be, you know, right in front of the town halls where we kind of first start out and then try to connect up to uh, the stop sign intersection. And for, and for this part of Sullivan Street, just past um, the town hall, is it imagined for both sides of the street? Both sides, and I, I, and I think the further side from Prime would be our responsibility, and then the mm -hmm. other side would be the developer's responsibility. Um, so we get now into the into Prime development, and there's I, I see this in decision decision trees, and this could go I could. I could have a field day with this, but I, I decided to simplify it. Our, our A solution is, is Mark finds a su suitable development partner, which we're in the best position we've ever been in for that scenario. The question is, why hasn't Mark done anything? It's because he's looking for the right partner that can take on the whole project with him. He doesn't want to make any decisions without um, a developer there with him. So either that works out or we're back at status quo. And then, I mean, we know what status quo feels like. And at some point, we start looking at the town taking control of the property. And that breaks down into two really good options. I mean, there's, there's a few other, and I'll get into those options. Are there any questions here? Oh, good. Uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. So what? Um, what determines whether we go to the left or the right? Um, oh, that's a good one. We'll get, we'll get right into that. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even plan that. Could, could you go back one? Yep. Uh, town purchases property. Does that assume he voluntarily sells it or the town involuntarily takes I think I think it voluntarily sells it. Yeah. And, and we have reason to believe he'll do that because he's, he's told us he, he, he has mentioned several times and he was here uh, the last time he was here was in May and that we had those discussions with him and of course the price varies uh, but I, it's it's an option that's on the table he is, our last meeting with him he said that he would sell all the properties the main property the Wilson Street parking lot the little corner lot on Jordan Street, 
and the duplex house for 2.2 million. He was going to keep the blue side building. But that was his offer then. He had offered it to somebody else at 1.5. So I think one of the things that we've talked about is he, right now he has, and I'm sure this is on your next slide, a developer that he is, has met with uh, last when he was here um, and had a very positive meeting with them. And it's He's a developer that we met with first and sent it to him. Yeah. And uh, we have high hopes. Well, that's why that's, that's, in the, that's the green box. Yeah. You know, but really this is about, so you start looking at the, the timeline. Now, if we want to see uh, construction by fall of 2020, we want to see something happen next year. So significant uh, um, construction, new facades, maybe some buildings get demolished or new buildings come up. So this is working backwards, right? So we start at where we want, which that means by late 2019 or early 2020, the planning board process needs to begin. It's going to be at least a nine month month project, just based on the fact, based on planning board needs something, engineer has to do it, getting back on the back on the agenda. I mean, nine months would be quick, which means fall of 19, there needs to be pre meetings with. I mean, the department, all department headings needs to be on board. Um, the developer needs to talk with the planning department and get everything in order to be able to submit an application. Um, so with that being said, it seems to me that right now we have a seven lot on paper subdivision, which we all know is just for Brownfield's application. So you would have to know the in infrastructures um, and the layouts for the streets and just basic ideas on the utilities that sort of thing. With, can that be developed by the uh, time the planning board gets in the winter of 2000, 2019? Depends on a how quickly Mark jumps on finding a civil engineer. That's the key. And when he was here last, Rick worked with him and gave him a number of different civil engineers that could start doing that for him. V.J. Feldman, your other planner, sat with him and really gave him a, what needs to happen. Very direct, which was, I think he needed to hear that from him. Um, the timeline, uh, just get back to the developer. He, the one he met, wanted two months to get through some of their other projects that they, big projects that they're working on, which I know some of them. So, and they are big projects. So uh, we've talked about giving him till the end of August as a deadline for us to try to see if this is going to happen. Um, I reached <coughs> out to these people today. Um, and like Tom had said, we had met with them prior to them even considering talking to Mark. Um, and they were very encouraged. And I reached out to them today because Mark had said he had a very positive meeting with them. They got right back to me and said uh, they did have a very good meeting with Mark. They have an individual that you just brought on um, who is going to be taking over that uh, project for them to do the analysis. Uh, I think it's, I know it's the, one of their daughter uh, who's doing it, Julie. Um, so she's on this and it's going to be the contact back and forth to Mark. Um, and she'll be doing the, the analysis and sitting down with the owners to see if this is a project that they want to get involved in. But um, we're, I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing from them, um, have been since we first met with them. So, uh, but I think we need to give a deadline and we've talked about that. We, there needs to be a cutoff point where if Mark and this company can't pull it together, then we need to do something on our own and, and figure out what's the best way of doing it. And we've, James and I, Rick and Tom has been in part of those kind of conversations, so. Yeah, so what do we do? I, I think it breaks down into two, two categories. Um, I think this sums up our, our best options. So we'll start with the one on the left. What, what happens is it's a developer competition. It's an RF, it's a request for proposals, request for qualifications. James, may I clarify? So this, these two options are if the town acquires uh, yes. the property? Yeah, yeah. So we would, we would um, there's a journal for the Northeast region, which includes like New York, Rhode Island, and um, you put 
you, you put blasted out there, um, this is a competition. It's, it, it bear, bear with me. So say the town acquires the property for $1.5 million. Whoever wins the developer competition, the, the property is sold to them for $500,000. In the, in, the in the RFP, in the RFQ, there's a stipulation that at least $10 million, $10 million or however we want to scope this. I mean, this will be a, a, this will be a process between every, all the stakeholders here. We're going to have our attorneys and we'll, we'll sculpt this in the way that, obviously, we did as well, in a way that mo we get the most value. At the very least, say $10 million. And these are all ballpark figures you can work with. You know, $10 million of, of, of building valuation has to be built in two years. So $10 million, it's $180,000 in property taxes. Payback, even when that two, two, two years built in, anywhere from seven, seven to 10 years. Um, and then you, we have um, downtown developed. Option two, um, the town takes ownership of it. We subdivide it, we engineer it exactly how we want it. By the time the cost of uh, infrastructure, road, engineering, it's about $300,000 to get that done. We could create 10 lots, plus or minus, sell them for, I've talked with one developer, he thinks on average you could get $200,000 per lot. The first few lots are sold at a discount, and theoretically, every successful project, the lots are worth more money incrementally, and we just, we, just, we sell the lots as we go. The question would be what the payback time is. It is one one thing that you don't have up there is um, any kind of uh, uh, agreement we have with the developer for our uh, um, TIF district, you know, and how that affects the property taxes. You know, is uh, you know if we if we do in the TIF and we're giving back you know fifty sixty percent. No, we don't have 180. Yeah, no, I would I would think if if it's sold at a million dollar discount, then there wouldn't be any need for a credit enhancement. I think they should be able to make the economics work. Would be the thing. I, I think the tip would be the tip would be for us, and that's actually part of the, the notes on the next on the next. Um, can we go in where yes, please? Sure. All that says is that the tip could be used to. Payback if we loaned it, loaned the million and a half. Yep. Um, I'm kind of curious um, when we're talking about the town buying it, the town doing this, the town creating the number of lots and deciding the number of years and the amount of money and you know that kind of thing. Um, who is the town? Who is going to represent the town? I mean, I, I it ultimately, I, maybe up to Steve, obviously, but I would assume some kind of steering committee would be yeah. created. If the town takes, <clears throat> tries to take possession of it um, by buying it, we have to have an extremely good plan in place of how the financial payback is going to be, or the voters won't give you that support. Um, I know they want to see something happen there, but we are the group that really have to have our ducks in a row. Um, from a legal perspective as well as financially sound um, approach. Um, I'm not sure giving it away for a million bucks uh, and, and only charging them half a million, it may be an alternative, but I think we have to look at a lot of different scenarios which what the payback would be. Um, but you'd have to form a steering committee, just like you did when you did form Division Berwick. But I think a little bit more financial uh, oversight along with planning board oversight in terms of how are we going to break this up to get the most bang for our buck. So I think that is yet to be determined. My hope is that this company that Mark wants to work with gets on board. That would be... Yeah, em emphasize that. I mean, that's our A, oh, a plan. Of course. However, I do think it's very important that right up front that we, whoever is on the steering <coughs> committee, we need to make sure that they're... Um, you know, our representatives from, um, you know, 
a representative group from, from all, for example, this group. Right. Right. Um, because I feel like um, it's critical that for success for the ta with the townspeople that we have um, everyone represented. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with the notion that the planning board gets too heavily involved in this part of the process because it's going to come before the planning board for review. And it just seems to me something not right well, to, then we to bring be involved in the planning of it and then review the plan. Well, bring Lee Jay in um, as, as a resource. Sure, Lee Jay is, that would be, but that's not the planning board. Yeah. <clears throat> but with the planning board, I think it's the scope of what we have to present to the planning board that we want to make sure yeah, no, no, I'm we have our there, ducks in a row. Th there's a point we can go, but I'm just... Yeah. One yeah. make clear we can't go all the way. Right. I, I did see in the warrant articles there was fifteen thousand dollars, which typically is what a vision borrowing gets per year, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it had the key words economic development tagged on it. Does that tie in with what we're talking no. about right now? That's the way it's always been. Yeah. That's yeah. how it's uh, well I guess um You'll be on the steering committee, Pat. No. <laughs> <laughs> no but I guess it's you like can be chair. I, <laughs> I just feel like it's really important um, with um, representatives from Envision Berwick, from you know, like the town manager, the board of selectmen. I just, you know, name, you know, even all the town offices. You know, I mean, like the fire, the police, the water. I, I don't know where you want to go with it, but I think, and I think for the for the community to feel like we're doing a good job about it, I think it's important that all the players are there. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt. That, that group has to be very well uh, entrenched in what we've been trying to do, uh -huh. also the financial aspect of it, the legal aspects uh -huh. of it, the planning aspect of it, I mean, before we roll it out to the public. And that might not be until next June, or it might not be until next November. Um, we have a better idea. Hopefully, it's that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. so I want somebody else to do this. That would be the ideal. That would be the yeah. ideal situation. Yeah. I don't so. want to be a developer. I think no matter how how you move forward, if, if this other option doesn't happen, uh, it would be very, very difficult to um, have the public trust and know that we're completely transparent moving forward. I don't know if there's any, if there's enough communication that you can do to make the public fully understand that somebody doesn't have uh, their own vested interest at, at hand. So um, I think it's a very difficult path to go down. Yep. If we can avoid doing that, uh, I think that's the better option. So I'm hoping that we don't have to go that way because if you develop a committee I don't think it would have, it couldn't, I don't think it can include anybody in this room, honestly, in order for it to be truly unbiased. So, that's it is a difficult task to take on, and, and it wouldn't be my first choice of things to do, but I think we can't let this sit another year or two because it's going to get stale. Well, I don't, and I that's don't want to my either, though. You know, I'd rather well, have quality instead of speed. So yeah. if we need to take a little more time to make something happen that's that's uh, fits what we would like, hopefully, you know, and not necessarily what you know, the the best profit margin is for someone, then I, I would like us to take a little more time and, and I don't make sure that due right. diligence is make done. Make sure we do it right. Right. And we have to do it right if it, right. if it comes down to that. Other or well, the public won't support us. Absolutely. So that's key. Yeah, the, so businesses interested in Berwick, I think seven out of those, that list, are ready to go in tomorrow if we had the opportunity. These um, are places, things that have contacted you guys? Like real interests. Like yeah. Real interests, yeah. Now what do they need to, to be able to go forward? What are they looking for? <laughs> So well, they need, they need, I mean, they actually they need buildings to go into. Yeah. I mean, they need well, I, understand. I mean, do they need roads? Do they need money on utilities? Do they need credit enhancement agreements? I mean, what kind of things are they? They need are a developer. They, they need a developer no, to, yeah. to make the space for these things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, they, I, don't, I don't think any one of these guys, with the exception of a few, unless maybe the aerospace and 
um, maybe one other on there had an appetite to actually do the de the development. Yeah, they so want, they want these are all people that wanted. To build yeah, they wanted. So space. they want somebody else to develop. They wanted the they piece of space. space. Yeah, 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 right. exactly. Well, I don't know about even the suit. I mean, they might be able to do the inside, but I think that the outside's got to be done. Yeah, the civil's got to be done. Yeah. all the underground utilities have to be in. Yeah. They have to be in the ready to go into move into the building and then retrofit it for their needs. And, and this is the best news of the day when you see this slide because these are all opportunities that people in town have created. We created all these opportunities. You know, that none of these none of these people came necessarily looking for us. It was started with us. So that's a good sign if no matter how this goes that if if you have provide an opportunity for some place for some place somebody to go in a place that they'll be yeah, and if, if, if you have those establishments over there we have a vibrant downtown right just that yeah. list right yeah. there can you imagine and, and we're looking for people all the time I mean, not just you know when we find people uh, there is a group coming into Maine that wants to do research um, but it's marijuana research. They want to be tied to a university in the Boston region, but they know Maine. It's extremely friendly. Maybe we're all high, but um, <laughs> they are uh, towards that marijuana industry. So uh, right now they're looking at opportunity centers yeah. because it's a lot of, which we're not one. But if that falls through, um, I got an email from her today that uh, they have already, we've already talked to them or Angus King's representative has spoken to them about Berwick, and I said we'd be very open to that, and we're very close open to the Boston. To what? Re huh? Open to what? Having a business come in that just does research. Oh, okay. It's very clean, uh, and the, the people that want to be tied to the universities, uh, and less expensive than Boston, which doesn't take much. So, um, what, what kind of use would that be, James? What, what, what is that? Is it just research? What is it? What are we? Have? Yeah, professional, yeah. professional building. Now. Professional okay. office yeah. building. Yeah, I mean, it's it would it would it would it create that would it be that marijuana industry that you then can't have another one within a thousand feet of? I don't think so. No, because you're not you're not doing any commerce from that. Yeah, you're yeah. just you're awesome. just doing research. You're not you're selling just doing the research. Okay. Yeah. All right. So these are things that most of these have all popped up <laughs> with us looking for things like that and talking to people. So, uh, but we've got to have a place for them to go. And that, I mean, that, and that, that, I think this is the, the next, the next slide. So this is something for, you know, everyone to sleep on and think about over the next couple of weeks. And we have a, we have a discussion about this. Does a, does a recreational marijuana storefront and does manu marijuana manufacturing belong downtown? So uh, there'd be a large investment in the buildings and equipment. We're looking at the creation of 15 to 25 jobs. You're going to have increased foot traffic. The cons, um, you're gonna have increased car traffic. You know, you have increased congestion. And there's the marijuana stigma where, you know, is Barrett gonna become the pot town of Maine? Um, are businesses gonna be scared off from it? Are people gonna think that our town's not, you know, uh, family family friendly? So you kinda, you kinda get the, there's this train coming of this economic engine of marijuana, and do we want to be a part of it? So that's a question for every, everyone, and I don't think we have we can talk about it. But I, I mean, it's 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 a really big question. Can, can we separate those into two different questions? Yeah, yeah. I, I and maybe add a, add a third, and, and that would be is manufacturing the growing no of no manu marijuana. Thank you. I, I should define marijuana manufacturing, and maybe, maybe Rick can help me out because it's. Processing, it's, it's yeah, it's processing, yeah. Yeah. processing. and not and butane, processing. The CD, oil, yeah. CBD yeah. products, things like that. See, because I, I mean, looking at that, I, I would say a storefront. I I personally would have no problem with that, but the manufacturing, I would probably want away from the downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know. But if we wanted an aerospace manufacturer to come downtown, that'd be fine. It depends on uh, how well, big. Well, but yeah, I think we talked about again light manufacturing. So again, you have to understand in terms of what what's. Well, you know, it's, it, it, it's sort of imagine you have a bakery downtown, and in the back, they're baking the muffins. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they're growing the wheat there. No. I think sort of the same analogy is here. They may be selling the products in the front. Yeah. They may be processing the oils and 
whatever. The I guess I would only be worried if they're not necessarily know. growing the marijuana yeah. so, in the so downtown. Marijuana manufacturing is not growing, it's processing. Okay. But is it, I, maybe I'm not familiar enough with it, but. Uh, it's complicated. It, I mean, is there smell? Is it heavily involved? Is not it, from what I understand, is it something that, that people would know what's going on from the outside if they walked by down the street? You know, that's what I would worry about. Only when I see Try, manufacturing, drive that's by what I try can in North Berwick. Well, I do, but I go by 40 miles an hour. So, yeah. Well, slow down, <laughs> slow down, slow down, slow down get out, and, and actually, there, there are two different operations there. Yeah. You go up by one and you don't smell a thing, you go by the other and you know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> so, it is certainly possible yeah. to process without odor. Um, but you need to be diligent and you and need to get the right partners in there to do it. If that's the case, then I have no problem with either being downtown. If you know if they're going to pay their bills, that's all that matters to me. Yeah. No, is, is, that, is that the same thing as Joe Reynolds LLC in, in North Berwick? Uh, no, the one I'm thinking of is Trike. So there's another one called Joe Reynolds LLC yeah. that's in the downtown by in the Hannaford, you know where Hannaford yeah. is, it's just for a little bit, more, just before the train tracks, you turn right, right there, yeah. down that little road. Yeah, Buffalo there's, a road. there's a building right there, and in that building, you get out of your car, you have no idea that there's, that, that there, uh, the, well, this is a little bit more, they're doing more than, than, they, than, than what's, been, what's been proposed here. They're talking, they're growing full scale. Yeah. You get out of your car, you have no idea they're growing there. Right. No idea. Right. Yeah. And the, the, because this is such a big issue, those guys have, um, go on a record to say anybody that wants to go through their facility to see what it's all about from an increased HVAC um, security all these things that they've had to dial in on and they're truly in the area are kind of leading you know what's you know some of the movement of doing it kind of the right way um, they would let anybody in you know who made an appointment who's trying to engage themselves and trying to get up to speed on what what this what this kind of means and the processing end is is really just aging. I guess you take that flower that, that grows and it gets aged, yeah. and um, to, which means it gets to a certain humidity. You're looking for a certain humidity level, and then that once it's at that humidity level, then you can process and turn into oils and other things. And um, it gets stored in bins when it's doing that. And you have and, and the the requirements from HABAC to keep it out of not only the building but out of the, at the atmosphere adjacent to the building is far less than what you need for a grow. Because when the plants are growing, they're, they're much more fragrant. When you go in that building and you go into the room where they're growing, then you can smell them. But it's not until you get there. It's, it's, it's enlightening. I mean, I had no idea until I, until I went and, and visited just to get into myself. I mean, and in terms of the stigma, the longer we keep it out of the downtown, the longer that stigma is going to be there. The stigma is not going to go away if we keep shying away from it as a top, you know, as as a business. The longer we keep it out, the longer there's going to be this stigma. And from the perspective of security, downtown would be the most secure since it's right next to the police station. Well, and give, given the number of medical marijuana operations we already have. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not buying the stigma. No, no, no. no. It's just three people buying. That's it. There's just three people that they're very shady. They're the ones that do it. They, Nobody they else does. They must move very quickly. That's right. Um, <laughs> is marijuana legal in New Hampshire? Uh, yeah. I think it was uh, Because here's the question the I would have. What does that do if people are buying it here and they're going across the bridge to New Hampshire? Are we going to get in the middle of some you know, police sting every time they get in their car and drive over the bridge, and, and I don't know. Well, it's on the agenda in New Hampshire. Yeah. So this and is going to be dealt with sooner it. rather than later, I think. Okay. And Not as fast as we've done here, obviously, but but that there's presumably by the time is anything is ready to go here, they, it might be legal there. But I mean, it, it would be on the patrons. It would be their responsibility, not ours. I mean, it's no different than. Well, the I laws know, about you, know, you, you want to be on the front page of every by, newspaper by, by because right, there's a sting on the other side of the bridge. Right, this is the it might be good. Who's going to come here and lie if they know there's a Just sting waiting. on the other side yeah. of the bridge? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah. I mean, I, well, I used important. to live in Pennsylvania, and and people used to love to go to New Jersey and Maryland to buy liquor, yeah. and the state police would you know go by the bridge and wait for them to drive up and be arrested. I don't know that New Hampshire would do that, but I don't know that they wouldn't at this. Okay. Interesting world. Things, things we need to really discuss more and 
and think about because I would, the only thing I was going to say from a planning board standpoint, as far as odors, that can all be engineered or required. They'll hold it control. Yeah, like, like Dave Springer had to do. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I mean, the last last thing is just um, trying to pull the pieces together. The Vision Berwick requested was granted some funds to bring back uh, the, the beta uh, GLA folks that helped us with our uh, visioning and uh, community engagement from uh, 2014. And they're going to be helping us kind of pull together everything we've uh, kind of talked about tonight, planning wise. Um, you know, starting at the top left, we've got our uh, there's public works and there's the, our, our kayak launch. There's some talks about potentially there's a trail that connects from there to Memorial Field. Potentially, there's some um, expansion opportunities at Memorial Field. There's some visioning we can do with Memorial Field. I want my basketball court. Um, there's, a, there's a parking lot, and we can overlay a potential um, community building. I think we're kind, of, we're kind of moving away from a community center idea because it's, it seems like a lot of the functions of a community center are being satisfied with other buildings. There might, I, I, I think we should wait a couple years and see what our community needs are. We can still overlay whatever, some just building at 71 Sullivan Street for whatever uses we need, and then we can draw on the sidewalks. And one of the big things that I'm looking for out of the process is site amenities, benches, signs. Where exactly should they go? Where the crosswalks go? And uh, this, again, this involves a whole other round of community engagement. And, and uh, speaking of community engagement, we have a comp plan that's coming soon. So that's going to be pretty amazing. And uh, we have the Rec Master Plan, which is really, it, it, it's the next domino to fall from uh, once downtown. They really go hand in hand. And uh, I think that's all I have. And I'm going to stop talking for a while. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Let's get. Um we can come back to this, I think, I'd like to have. Yeah, so um, now it's, it's a perfect time to have Elise Weeks from uh, Pixels of Pulp, and she's here to speak about branding, and now's a perfect time as we're setting our direction for the near future. Do you want to unplug and I'll plug in? Sure. One moment, please. One of the things I'd, I'd like to talk about at some point, you know, I mentioned that I've selected me several times, is uh, impact fees. Right now, it's split between open space and recreation. And uh, I, I, I'm proposing that we uh, divide that differently and uh, put some of that money into you know, facilities like sidewalks and things like that. And you know, I don't know how everybody else feels about you know dividing the money up, is, but we're at a point now looking at doing some major improvements that <coughs> Maybe we should go 50% to utilities and facilities and, you know, split, split the uh, other 50 between open space and rec. Steve, are we encumbered by any, or Tom, are we encumbered by any state laws or anything that require? You have to spend the money that you collect on impact fees within a 10-year period. So we, we have to we've track when the money came in and, and, and where it, so we spend it, the first money, and, and move it forward. So if we hang on to any money more than 10 years, we have to give it back to the people who pay the impact fees. And, and can we only spend it on what was in effect at the time that we collected it? Or meaning if, if we now expand the no, range, can we use we, money that's already there yeah, well, for these yeah. new spending things? Or, or only what I think we have to point to already, already right? Yeah, Go yeah, moving you, forward. you have to have specific yeah, projects forward. that you're moving forward. Like, just give you an example. If we decide, if we get the opportunity to buy a budding land to Memorial Field, which we are going to have that opportunity, that money, impact fees, can be used to purchase that, um, which would be very good. I don't know what the asking price is yet, but uh, it's still to be But good. we can do that now, now the way it's set up. Yeah, we right. can, yeah. yeah. We have money too. Yep. Yeah. But then if, if that comes up in the future and you've allowed 50% for sidewalks, can't use well, well, sidewalk have the money. money. Right. No. So we, uh, open space and recreation are very similar. I, I view it as a very similar thing. So we would take that money and combine it with the recreation field 
money, uh, the recreation money. And so it would be a pretty good sum of money. And then if we decide, the board decides to change it and do 50% into infrastructure, which would be underground utilities, sidewalks, things like that, we would be starting from scratch uh, on that funding. And, and, but it, it actually collects pretty darn quick, you know, with all the growth that we've had here in town. So we have upwards of $58,000 right now, at just recreation and probably another 58 in open space. So uh, we have the funding to, to spend. And I guess I'm not into this very much, but I'm asking as a resident. <laughs> um, I thought like uh, the development of crime tanning and the tax and all that stuff was going to be doing a lot of sidewalk and infrastructure and all that kind of thing. So why, why is the The TIF money was going to be planned to use that. But right now we're not collecting any TIF money. So until we see improved development uh, and new growth, which is what TIF money is all about. Right, but if we're following the timeline where we're going to have development by 2020, um, well, the infrastructure is going to be more than, you know, uh, you know, so I guess that's in, all in, I in, just, infra you know. Infrastructure on that site, the okay. prime site, would be taken care of with that development. Okay. The money that we would spend on other sidewalks would be to extend it up Sullivan Street to make that connection on our side, okay. to, 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 to create new sidewalks where the prime development isn't. You know, that's where we could use that type of that money for. But let's let this person. We <laughs> <laughs> hooked her up and she's just Thanks. waiting. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, see a lot of familiar faces, but I'm just going to do a quick intro. I came in and did a presentation, it was well over a year ago, so I'm just going to do a really quick um, intro of who I am. My name is Elise Weeks and my business is called Pixels and Pulp. Um, I'm based in Berwick and my business partner lives up in Portland. Um, we do branding, websites, signage, packaging, all that good stuff. We've been doing that for over 15 years. We have clients local, um, around the U.S., abroad. And we work with um, progressive clients. We do a lot of work with um, kind of socially and environmentally responsible organizations, um, those working for social justice. And we kind of specialize in campaign work and design systems. So this is a great project for us just because we kind of think about things in a holistic perspective. So town signage, how things look on the website, the t-shirts people are wearing, backdrops that are going to happen on the stage and the, you know, the, the community, you know, the, the concert series, all of that kind of stuff. So this is a fun project for me, not just as a design challenge, but as, you know, someone who lives in the town. This is really exciting for me. Um, just like a really small handful of a couple of the um, other projects that I've done. CELTS, that's the Southeast Land Trust of New Hampshire. Um, we've worked with Sweet Baby Vineyard, um, Mr. Fox, I'm not sure, you probably have seen their stickers around in various coffee shops and restaurants. Um, Nature Groupie, they're an initiative of the um, UNH Cooperative Extension. They're kind of um, outdoor volunteer opportunities. We've worked with Camden National and then Sustainable Energy for All. They're like a, that was an initiative of the um, Ban Ki-moon, who was the previous um, Secretary General of the UN, one of their sustainable um, development goals. So, uh, you know, packaging, app, graphics, um, logos, all of that kind of good stuff. Um, so, I've been invited to do this work, which is really exciting. Um, and so, th this process has been going on for a little bit. I've been um, kind of reviewing all of the the town, you know, the surveys that were conducted a number of years ago and just, you know, talking um, with Envision Berwick. And so this is sort of like a little snapshot of where we are, who we are, sorry. Um, Berwick's a great place to live. We have kind, smart people. We have this can-do spirit. We have great schools, an engaged town government. We have farms, farmer's markets, a kayak launch, recreational fields, summer theater, all kinds of good stuff. A new brewery and clearly lots of potential for other businesses to come in. Um, river, ponds, hiking, biking trails, all kinds of outdoor opportunities just to have fun and enjoy life outside. TV station, brand new website, good job, Gabe. <laughs> um, social media presence and 
um, on the cusp of you know turning significant areas of our town into even more beautiful and functional spaces for our community to enjoy. We know what the town wants. You have all this data. People want a more attractive downtown. You know, business. We want businesses to come here. We want more recreational opportunities sense of community, thinking about things in a um, sustainable way, affordable, access to the river, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a great time to be doing this branding effort. As you're thinking about more people wanting to come to the town, enticing more businesses to come here, there's already tons of interest, and I think the more we can kind of develop who we are having a solid professional look and feel. When you come over the bridge and you see a really nice sign, businesses want to come here and put our materials you know, in their spaces and you know, just having a, kind of elevating our brand a little bit um, will be kind of all part of this process. So I've already kind of delivered my initial presentation of the two concepts that um, I designed and the following is the direction that was selected by and Vision Berwick and a few other folks. And so basically what I like to do is show the logo by itself and then a few other kind of, um, show it in context in a few other ways. So there's some sort of rough ideas here. This is a starting point, I will say that. So, um, you know, things like signage, t-shirts, um, the website, None of this is set in stone. This is just kind of like where we could go with it. So I just want to keep, keep that in mind as we review this. So here we go. Berwick, Maine. <laughs> so this is what we're thinking for the new Berwick logo. Um, this pairs a kind of a clean, very legible typeface for the word Berwick with a little pine tree nestled in the W. Um, and kind of paired that with a more sort of modern sort of script font. It's a little bit playful. It's a little um, kind of a little bit off kilter, off to the side. Um, the pine trees, that's an important symbol for our town. That's what brought the initial settlers here, you know, way back um, looking for opportunity. And it's still relevant today. People come to this this area, you know, for the beautiful, you know, forests, and um, that's why I came here. Ninety percent of the reason I bought my house was because of the view I have at the top of Diamond Hill Road, looking off into the distance. Um, and then with the birds, so it kind of gives a little bit of an uplifting, hopeful look. It gives a little bit of dynamism, some movement. It's active, um, and then the direction that they're they're coming in. It, it, sort of implies there's coming in for a landing, kind of finding a home here in Berwick. So this is sort of a couple of alternate versions. So what I like to do is create a system where you don't always have to have your logo on white, right? But that's not realistic. So with our, I want to have a really sort of minimal color palette. Um, and the primary colors would be sort of this rust orange color paired with a sort of earthy green. And then we could use those in different ways, but we, when I create a brand guide, we'll create rules around how all of these colors would get used. And then as we kind of develop more materials, we would incorporate more sort of <coughs> accent colors that would complement the sort of primary color palette. And then kind of broad brush here, just sort of applying some of these um, you know, marks to the website. This would be an, another project in and of itself. I know there's been a lot of work that went into to doing the new website. So this is just, again, just kind of like a snapshot of, you know, updating the, the site to just have like the, the appropriate color palette. And then some things on the left. These could be things like stickers. Um, somebody at the last Envision Berwick um, meeting had mentioned, you know, those the coasters that you get that you just throw down on the tables that people want to kind of grab under their beers. You know, things like that. Pe things people could stick on their cars or be on a sweatshirt. And then really rough, um, but just to kind of give a sense of town signage. We we're going to have wayfinding signage around town. So those would be sort of, you know, the multiple um, directional signs on a, some kind of coast. And we've already been talking to the sign 
folks about um, working on this project. And then a couple more just little kind of mocked up merch ideas. Um, onesies, sweatshirts, mugs, things like that. Just so you can kind of see like how this, this brand would, um, the kind of range that it would have. So to me, this feels like a very warm, approachable, friendly brand, but still feels, you know, polished and sophisticated. There's some, Maine has such a good thing going on. There's really, really interesting, great brands here in Maine. I am intentionally steering away from sort of greens and blues just because you see a lot of that here in New England. So still earthy, still warm, um, but maybe something a little bit more unexpected. Um, What's unique. Yeah, exactly. We want to stand out. And I think, too, the, the hawk imagery, I was kind of doing some, some more research on that. And I, I like that hawks can sort of be a symbol of leadership and focus. Um, I feel like we have an opportunity here to kind of be an example for other communities of, of what could be possible. We're actually getting things done here. And so I think, you know, I think we could be an example um, to other folks. So yeah, so that's where that's where we're at, um, and so I think the you know we have to kind of discuss what the process would be for actually gathering some additional feedback in a strategic way. Um, how much or how little we sort of involve the public at large in this process because that can get a little um, messy. A little messy. A little messy, <laughs> um, but we could, you know, do sort of a soft rollout. I guess you could say um, we had kind of talked about doing like a opening it up for about a week to gather some initial kind of feedback before we do like a full blown, you know, rollout of, of everything just to kind of um, get some some community involvement and then just you know kind of going through the process of actually adopting a new brand. I don't actually know how that would work in a town. <laughs> um, usually it's a client saying, yes, approved. So I think... I think you just did soft roll it out, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I was say, is, this, is this, on, is this also on television now? Yeah. 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 Can yeah. see this too? Maybe asking for people to comment. I like it. Somebody. It's simple, yeah. but you know, the roast is good. You bring the beer company. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's right. next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we would we would have a kind of a schedule for how we want to roll out each thing. It would be a phase. You don't do everything overnight, obviously. It, you know, we would sort of pick the things that are the most, the top priority. We talked about having some stuff for the concert. Um, you know, town signage. You know, we would figure out which are the most important ones to to start with. Website and social media is super easy because that's just give you some graphics, up they go. Um, so that's usually a pretty quick one. And then kind of develop a plan for some, you know, if we wanted to actually develop some print collateral um, that are geared toward various audiences, you know, to put in either the schools, to give to business owners. Um, business you know. owners. I think that's the, what, that is the key here is that we need to reward some of these businesses that have come to Berwick, and this is a simple thing that we've done that can now help them expand who they are and tell people where they are, more importantly. And I can, I can, I can envision that logo on a couple of umbrellas right over there at Corner Point Brewing. Mm -hmm. How phenomenal would that be to be coming across that and see that, mm -hmm. see some branding immediately, not to mention our sign when you, when you come across. I think it'll be very important to have merch for your, com your summer concert series. I think that would be the big indicator of whether it's a hit or not. I mean, because I mean, if you you know print up uh, you know a li limited run of T-shirts or something like that, and they all sell out, then that's a good indicator that it's something that yeah it needs to be rolled out. If they don't sell at all, well, then we have some T-shirts we can give out in town, but we know that we need to maybe look in a different direction. That's definitely trades are another opportunity as well. So, yeah, yeah. So you get a lot of vision that way. I think you'll get a lot of feedback instantly as well. So yeah, just get, get, people make 50 t-shirts and throw them out during the parade, and then okay. see what happens yeah. after that when those people who are wearing them around want to get theirs. Yeah. And they start to see it here and there. Oh, wait a minute. It's a 
second time I've seen that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean. That might have sweatshirt right now. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of hits on TV right now saying, what do I buy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I would wear that, absolutely. That's kind of my measure for a good brand is if I want to wear it. <laughs> so. I'm glad you put the word name. I don't think I'll fit in the onesie, though. So uh, awesome. Yeah. 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 Yep. I would check the silhouette on the birds, so I think they're buzzards. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they look like, they look like an eagle to me. Uh, yeah. look like they're, they're no. not buzzards. Well, at least the top ones yeah. are hawks. Those are hawk feathers. Are yeah. you sure? Yeah. 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 Out of tail. Yeah, tail. Oh, yeah. Never mind. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you. You can just leave Double that up. Double check in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want bulges circling. <laughs> no turkeys. And I said the same thing. Did you? They look very close. <laughs> Thank, you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Philly. Right. Thank you. Yeah, we, so we were in one meeting, yeah. and it, it took like 45 minutes for me to like realize the difference between a seal and a logo. Yeah. I was like, they're the same thing. <laughs> Everyone at the table was like, no, no. <laughs> different. And then like all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, logo. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, didn't they just redo that seal or something? Didn't they just work on that? Didn't stay the same. The we updated. She, she updated it. Yeah. Just the text. Yeah. But yeah, at some point we may want to do the full seal. But I like it. Yeah. yeah, that's Works a larger so conversation. Okay, um, on the traffic study, um, one of the things that James and I really need from the board, from planning, anybody who has been involved in that, is a direction. We had options that were presented. Um, and what are What's the flavor? You've all had a chance to see what the traffic study had laid out. Um, and I know Tom's voiced several times that he does not want to see Sullivan Street go uh, two-way because it's just going to add to the congestion. Um, I wouldn't want to see the parking go away. That's, that's, that's there because that, that's obviously what's going to happen. Yeah, if parking doesn't away. need to go away. I think we just need to slow people down. And slow people down. Yeah, that's what we have to do. And I think that James and I were at the build uh, main conference recently, and the, the a guy did a presentation. I forget. I don't recall his name, but it was the, t the title of it was a national consultant on safer streets. We've done them all over the country and in really populated places. And uh, you make the corner, and if you if you see a narrower road, you automatically slow down. And just with the bollards that James put up, that automatically slowed people down. Yeah. And I think that is that would accomplish a lot in itself. Having bump outs in this design, I think, would be would be truly great. Uh, as, um, as a point of reference, I wasn't sure how many people actually had a chance to drive through Kenny Bunk on Route 1 as you go yeah. through the downtown areas. They have the bump outs for parking, mm -hmm. and the road, like you said, is designed to go slow. Uh -huh. you, you definitely cannot speed on that road. So I think there's a point of reference if you get a chance to just, you know, just stroll down that road. I, I don't think anybody has a problem actually driving 20 miles an hour because actually you got a chance to take in, you know, they do a nice job in terms of their, their landscaping around the area. And it's a very, it's a very inviting section of downtown to drive through at a very slow pace. I know, I know Robert Percy hates bump outs because Too of bad. plowing, but Oh well, it's well, a limited right. area. I mean, it's a limited yeah, area. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're really just talking about the area around the town hall yeah. and yeah. the surrounding yeah. roads. And you come down here, and all of a sudden, you see these bump outs, and it will, if we start putting other amenities like street trees, you know, uh, you know, lights and and things like that, now you know you've arrived at the downtown. Mm -hmm. You know, and it becomes clear with the way that we've set this up. And right now, it's just a gateway into. It. It's just a gateway to New York. People it, driving in. It, it, you know, since James and I were playing in traffic, putting the ball ones up and stuff, I spent a lot of time out here just watching traffic. And when the traffic on the bridge gets the green light, they start accelerating, yep. and they don't stop till Wilson Street. Yep. So, if, if they said, you know, putting a, a, a raised crosswalk down by the corner here by Subway. You know, you put that there, and they're not going to be able to accelerate all the way. You know, that's going to be an automatic slowdown. The other, the other thing to consider too is I think the raise thing would be good, but then the, the, there's really good feedback on you with you can do a lot with paint 
now they have this almost three-dimensional appearance yeah. to yeah. some that yeah. almost oh, yeah. appear, they uh, appear to be stuff. raised, but yeah. they're not, and you, and it's a paint. It's, it's a visual. It's, just, it's paint. Yeah. You know, Main DLT cheap. is on board with that. They said. What is that? Yeah. Oh, wait, I asked about it. it. What is that yeah. called? The, the type of paint that does that. I, no, it's not the paint. It's the way it's actually. Yeah, no, I know. I know the 3D effect. effect. I know the 3D effect. effect. I'm trying to remember what the name of the. They wouldn't the wouldn't be in favor on that. On that, like what? But we could do it on Solomon, right? Shaded, I think, is what it is. Well, you just can't make it look like a sinkhole. Right? Yeah. You can make it look like I'd like to see a show of hands that people leaving meetings. Like I've almost gotten. Oh, yeah. I made eye contact with people a little, with stopping a little bit late at least three or four times yeah. in the years that I've been coming here. And it would be, and I think since the dollars that have been put in, I know that people are more alert. Oh, yeah. So I, I think we've gotten, gotten a lot with a little. Yeah, I think that in combination right together would actually be the best. The, the, the first, the, the subway crosswalk being like you know, a speed bump and then the other ones being shaded to look like they're, they are also speed bumps would just deter the whole area you know James you know when we were doing the ball and we talked about the park you know in Rochester there was a question about whether you know, what we could do there for this because the state aid road did you ever find out any answers I on think, that I think it's just we just need like an engineer to sign off and say you're good here this is the distance you can do it I, I'm absolutely I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to Jim and I'll reach out to maybe Jason and, and, and um, talk know, to Steve Landry. Yeah, right. I think we need to talk with our um, main DOT coordinator in our region. Yeah, yeah. because that's an, I want. I'd like to do this. Yeah, Jason. well, hey, I, I wanted to do it that day, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to do this, and I'd like to figure out if we can do from Spencer Matthews across. James, what do we need for our travel lane? It's only it's it's not a lot. And I think you it is. The main turnpike, the travel lane, is 11 feet. 11 feet. Uh, turn you know, it, it is, the lane. Is, uh, yeah. you know, Jim there was talking about, you know, is, uh, 10 feet is typical, you know, but if you get down as far as 9 feet, he said, no, yeah. so if you're going straight. And these lanes were like, what, 15, 16, 17, 18? Right. Yeah. But you got to remember, we're not going straight on, like, on a turnpike. You're going dead straight. Yeah. Right. Um, so. But still, you're not going 70 either. <laughs> You know, so I mean, again, it's the narrower, the narrower, the the slower. Yeah. yeah. What, what is the consensus around the table for Sullivan Street in front of the town office? The the options were two way, one way, um, changing the parking arrangements. You've all had a chance to keep it one way. Keep it one way. I don't think there's enough traffic to justify going two way at the whatever. I mean, what, what's the expense to do two way? A lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're talking at least a half a million. Plus, I've eight. I've never had a problem with the traffic level. You know. Well, the the whole way. thing the the whole thing pushing turning this into two way was to eliminate the travel lane down in front of One Sullivan. They're going to drive all the traffic down Rochester Street around this way, so that could get closed off. That was what was driving the two-way traffic out here. You know, and I understand. You know, they are in a tough situation over there, but in my concerns is with the town hall. You know, is um, you know, safe access here is my concern. There may be some more magic you can work at the bridge. If you, I kind of feel if you had a two-way and Sullivan Street, it would complicate the bridge more than it is yeah. today. Um, but I think the one way on the the other side of the town hall, single makes, lane. Yeah, make a lane. Right. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and if you have to put another speed bump or a raised crosswalk, you, know, you do just it. Don't make a real high one. Yeah. yeah. No, you don't. You don't need to. You know, the 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 the, the key to those is make them wide, mm -hmm. so when they're plowing yeah. snow, they don't have a no okay. shot bump, yeah. Yeah. you know, is, uh, well, is, but what James was talking about, you know, the width of travel lanes is, when we were doing it out here on the corner, I think it was like 22 feet right. of pavement out here yeah. in one lane of traffic. And if you look at the different crosswalks, you can see where the traffic pattern is. And the one out here down Rochester Street is all the traffic is off to the other side. You know, they don't split up until they hit Bow Street, typically. You know, that's when they yeah. get into well, the One of the things, 
as a manager I'm, I'm aiming for is to get us into the revenue end of things, of getting funding to make this happen. James and I have already got ourselves into the CATS uh, program, but it's not a lot of money. They only get about $700,000 a year, and we're already looking out at 2022, possibly 23. Um, so, and there's always, the coastal communities have big projects that they've been doing and always want a lot of the funding. So, the key is, for, from my perspective, is not to go to the taxpayer for these kinds of projects. It's to find, um, we know whoever develops Prime, they're going to be pushed into making the improvements on the sidewalks around that and all the landscaping. That's very doable. Nope. But, but then you have the, all the sidewalks that we have um, on the opposite side, like Wilson Street, um, the one in front of the town office needs to be redone. They, uh, believe it or not, we have an ADA person coming into Berwick to look at compliance issues, um, and we're going to get slapped hard because our sidewalks are not ADA compliant anymore, um, and the town office is, has some ADA issues. Um, so we, those are things that all, we all have to address. Uh, but I think the Sawmill Hill concept is pretty straightforward and, and a vast improvement. So, um, uh, but if everybody's in consensus with what um, the, the one way on Sullivan and, and narrowing down uh, Rochester Street, that's a good start for us to, I, I really want us to be on the list for CDBG funding this coming year. And we have to put together a package, which I think will be pretty easy because you've got so much data uh, that you put together uh, and with you know, support of the community. Um, and we have to come up, with, if we get awarded that, we have to come up with a 20% match, which we're putting money aside uh, this coming year in the budget for those kinds of things. But there's also rural development uh, funding that some and economic development funding. Some of it with them is, is uh, state, or uh, it's grants and some of it's uh, loans. But I want to be, us to, to be able to explore all that. So if we have some definitive concepts that we say, let's go with these and see what we can do, that is really critical. Um, can I get a CDBG grant to pay for some of the the sidewalk right here. Yeah. And just, we are going to try to do the parking lot. The, the minor? You, yeah. The, the whole concept, what was the original traffic study you have, where we've already getting prices to, uh, we've taken down the trees that were there. We just have to get the stumps out. It's a little bit, bit of excavation work. We have to put in some granite because we want to make it two way going in, an existing two way. They only have up on Eleanor's Way only be one exit, um, and we have to do some stuff to keep the people from parking there overnight to live in the apartment building. But that will come with enforcement. Which, uh, but that we're going to try and do this year. I didn't have quite enough money to do all the roads I wanted, but I have enough to probably to do a big amount, uh, and then that parking lot. Right, I want You can pick up like five, ten. 15 spots, just depending yeah. on yeah. once you get the space and then you read, read the lines. And depending upon the cost, one of the things that James and I have talked about and I'd like to see is if if you have chosen a decorative lighting that you would like to see in town and everybody's in agreement, it'd be nice to put that in there when we do that parking lot to show the public mm -hmm. that we're doing something. I think that's very critical and that's low-hanging fruit as far as I'm concerned. And I, would, I say we, we did we did pick it effectively when we that, that process where we got, we first started here with these lights, but then we got the Walmart generic brand version, which is, um, uh, I think, $7,000 cheaper, but it looks just <laughs> like it. And it was picked out through Mike Lassell through our form-based code process. So I'd say that's that's the one we go with. Yep. Okay. Long day, only day. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Everything. Want to just? Um, do you want to flash up on my spreadsheet? Did you get that in there? I, I didn't. Oh, shame on you. I know. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't. One of the things that the board has got coming on their one of their next meetings in July is to look at the overall capital improvement programs that aren't necessarily department driven, and, and just to give you, I'll just go through some of them. Uh, we have a, to do some work in the. 
town office because we had heating issues. They replaced the furnace five or six years ago, great furnace, but they didn't tell you that the piping is just as old as the furnace was. And we've been having, window. yeah, uh, 1930, just for 1938 piping. And the last two years we've been spending money repairing them as they burst open and spread water. And just, that's gotta be done this coming year. Right now, we're looking at about a $60,000 cost to remove, to do some of the work on the first, the bottom floor, and then do heat pumps on the rest of the building upstairs. I don't want them digging into the walls, which would be a requirement if we were gonna replace the piping. It doesn't make sense for us to replace the piping. Heat pumps make much more sense. So I've got a price on that. I just gotta find some of the money. Um, the other stuff we have, I have a $60,000 project at Public Works that has to be done this year, which we just found out, and it wasn't planned for in the budget. It was planned for five years out. But we had to bring up, DEP's requiring us to bring up what we have uh, to safety. It's 40, around $45,000 for just over 50000 Yeah, for the price of the tank and to enclose it above ground is 50 some odd thousand doesn't make sense to, to fix the old without, we just might as well replace the new. Um, the longer term projects, like I said, is ADA compliance issues. This chairlift we have in the town office, I don't know how old it is, but it's, it, it's sketchy. It doesn't work all the time. We had a community dinner here and we had a gentleman with a wheelchair, 94 years old, who was getting an award and he couldn't get in the building up to the top floor. That's embarrassing and we need to put that on the radar. And uh, also, um, just we have two bridges in town that are need some serious work. I've had engineers out to look at them to give me a ballpark number. It's, it's over a half a million dollars each to fix them. And the state has a program, if it gets funded, where they do 50-50. So, so we're still looking at a half a million dollars that we'd have to come up with to fix of 20, 250,000 to fix the one that I, I not live with, it has to be fixed, Di Di Diamond Hill. Diamond Hill and the Ridland Road is, another, is the other bridge, but I can just block that off and, and not even use it, just put barriers up and say, we've discontinued this bridge for now. So we can do one and put off the other. Um, we have an opportunity for recreational fields to purchase, again, um, right next door several different parcels, we need to buy those. Uh, if you want to expand the works and the group's uh, recreational programs, it will be a tremendous asset to, to the downtown area. LED lighting, the Board of Select Moves had a meeting with the Tri-Town, uh, it was North Berwick and Lebanon. We had a presentation about replacing all of our street lights in town. The cost of that is, was $96,000. <laughs> Mark Pendergast, well, let's do it. Well, you gotta have the money first. And we don't have it, it wasn't in the budget this year because it was too late in the process, but uh, the payback is like two and a half years. It's crazy not to do it. Um, if, one of, if I can just jump in here. Yep. One, of, one of the things you know, the people have been talking about, some, what some of the towns are doing, is the, 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 the payback is in about three years. Is what some of the towns are doing is they're taking some, after the initial money is paid off, they're taking some of their savings they get from not using the old lights, and they're taking that money and putting it into a different fund to do energy improvements and things yeah. like that around town. The, the difference between what they would have paid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, a great idea. Even, even if you just take half of, That's a great idea. Half of, half of the, the, the savings yeah. and put yeah. it in there. So you're talking about you know, $30,000 a year, so. That's a great idea. And what we're, what we're looking at, too, is that we have a new fire station, just for those who don't know, going up. Uh, hopefully they'll break ground in July. I'm getting a little nervous about that, but um, I may push it back a little bit. But um, we are having it built with the option for solar power in the, in the infrastructure in the inside the building. So all we would have to do is put the uh, panels up. But also this, this building here is, is perfect for solar energy up on these roofs. Uh, just because of its direction, it's wide open. Um, 
this was my pet peeve, and I know Serena and James have been pushing it. They'd like to make the prime tanning solar or, or geothermal. I, I think we need to be very progressive, and this is just my own opinion, to make sure that we push towards that if we can. Um, we have a future that needs to be looked at pretty seriously. Is uh, Talking about solar again, is uh, one of the things we learned was that Say we put up a solar farm someplace in town, whether it, at the Estabrook site with the fire station or wherever, sure. it is, we can take the savings we get from that and use it for now it's nine different accounts. You know, so we pay for the fire, the police, the town hall, the recreation, the transfer station, public works, all that could be taken off. That could be those bills could be taken off with the money we get from the solar. Okay. Electric bill. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. The other big project that we have coming, uh, we're in the design phase right now, is the MS4 project, which is going to be up towards Great Falls Park and Moulton Street. Um, the, en the engineers threw out a number that I couldn't believe. They, they, they're saying the cost is going to be $1.1 million to get that done. I find that very hard to swallow. It's going to be that expensive, but I'd probably eat my words. But, um, but even uh, Christine, Christie said it would be a half a million before I heard that number. So I'm, I'm. We're not even talking about a million for all the site work up on the fire station. I know. That's. So anyway, um, these are projects that we. I need to get into the budget somehow to plan for in, down the road. Um, some of it. We can do with grant funding. I'm hoping. I heard today that the states are revamping their efficiency main, and they're adding more funding into different areas. So to encourage, this, I think this is coming from the new governor, solar power and things like that. That 1.1 includes a complete um, reconstruction of the road, side the sidewalks, and I believe the lighting. The lighting. Okay. It's right, still well, a lot of money. Well, but, but yeah, but we're talking about the MS4 project. Is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just all that's the integrated. Yeah, everything integrated. Together. Okay, that, that, but I we, feel a little better. It's not. <laughs> but you did, the, the <laughs> issue is that you're, you're <laughs> digging up the road. You're digging up the roads at that at this time. If you're gonna, you need to try and do all this stuff at the same time. And I, and I talked with every time I plan to do a road, I let Jay and the water department know these roads were reclaiming. And especially up towards Walton Street in those areas, that's where their infrastructure is. So we have to be very sensitive in how deep we go. Um, and I'm not so sure we need to rebuild them right from the ground up, but uh, they don't get the kind of traffic, and they actually aren't in that bad of shape. But uh, but the, just to be, I want everybody to be aware of some of the expenses that the town is facing, uh, and the board's going to have a, a workshop on this all by themselves to give give me some, a little bit more direction. Hang on your hat, guys. But, uh, and who knows what will pop up in between that time. But, but it, I know James and, and I and some of, and Rick, we're looking at grants and, and funding opportunities is to fund some of these things. So, uh, and I know the bridge work, you can thank Angus King and Susan Collins. They have a bill in the legislature uh, for Maine and a lot of money coming for infrastructure and it's all for municipalities. None of it is for state. So that's encouraging. And I wanted to hug Angus's yeah. aide saying thank you. I hope it flies through. Yeah. So um, the only thing I'm just going to say is we, we, I'm currently looking at solar again. We have that big landfill. And now that it's possible, um, one idea was with the town and what accounts you have is designing an energy cooperative. You know, I don't know how much space or how much power we can generate on that space. Yeah. But it'd be worth looking at. I mean, and uh, you know, a similar thing was done in, in Elliot. You know, so you yeah. could prioritize who gets the first. Yeah, Revise down the line, was know? one of the people that I think Revise did the one in Elliot. Revision, yeah. Yeah, and they're the ones that gave a short presentation to yeah, the three did, towns. Yeah. So it's it, it, the technology has vastly improved over the years for what we can capture. And cost. That's a big yeah. Yeah. solar panel. Yeah. So. Um, but these are some of the things that are coming, and we have to plan carefully how we do it and, and search for funding. And the pots are not as big as we'd like, but we'll see what we can do.
But Maybe a citizen will come along and just write you a check. For there you go. Like two and a half million dollars. Mark Ahaya. There you go. He, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, I, in the funding mechanisms, James, we were looking at a lot of different things. Taxes is the last place I go to. I, I don't want to raise taxes. I've got a, a $600,000 budget item for the next, at least the next five years just for roads. And that we have to stay on. Uh, so that drives, that's almost a mill to the tax rate if we don't have the revenue to offset it. So it's quite expensive, but it needs to be done. So, all right. Any questions, recommendations? Good time. Keep up the good work. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So, a lot of fun. Do this again in the fall? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll take the summer off. And hopefully we'll have even better. Thank you.